All right. Welcome back, everybody, to episode 53 of the Quantum Science Seminar, which today will be all about quantum computing. As usual, we would like to have your questions. Please send us your questions via email to quantumscienceseminar at gmail.com or use the YouTube live chat at the right or at the bottom of the screen. As always, there's a 30 second time delay between what we do here and what you see as live on YouTube. And with that, I'd like to hand over to Andrew, who will introduce our speaker today. So thank you very much, Sebastian. Um, it's a great pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Helmut Katzgraber. Um, Helmut has a very, in a very international background. Um, he was uh, born and grew up in Peru, uh, studied then at the UTH in Zurich, um, before moving to the University of California, Santa Cruz, which is where he completed his PhD. After that, he returned to the UTH as a postdoc and fellow before taking up a faculty position at the University of Texas at Austin. He then uh, took a, a little bit of a change in his, um, in his career um, and, uh, and worked then first for Microsoft um, and now for, um, for Amazon Web Services. Um, Helmut originally became very well known for his work on many body physics, including seminal papers in the areas of spin glasses and the development of numerical methods to study them. And then over the past decade, he's become one of the leaders in connecting these areas with quantum computers and quantum algorithms, including taking these techniques to develop quantum inspired or more generally physics inspired algorithms to solve challenging optimization problems on classical computers. Um, Helmut, welcome to the Quantum Science Seminar. Um, we're really looking forward to hearing your perspective on this area and uh, your perspective on uh, quantum computing in industry more broadly. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, for some reason, there we go. So uh, what I wanted to say is uh, I used to be a professor actually until December of last year, not at UT Austin, but at Texas A&M, both big rivals, just FYI, <laughs> no worries. So um, yeah, I'd like to tell you a little bit about quantum computing and industry, and I know that this is being broadcasted on YouTube, so I figured I'll start, start with a very broad, basic overview and then work my way down to some new algorithms to solve really hard combinatorial optimization problems. So I'll start with a brief technology overview, uh, mostly because there's a lot of misconceptions about the different types of quantum hardware. I'll tell you a little bit about near-term applications with a focus on optimization, a word about benchmarking, and then I'll tell you a little bit about nature-inspired solutions versus quantum annealers, in this particular case, say D-Wave, and then how we can scale up to solve much larger, much more challenging problems using hybrid algorithms, followed by a very quick flash of selected applications of interest in industry, and a kind of small overview of quantum at AWS. Now, why is industry, especially think about it, IBM, Google, Amazon, Microsoft, interested in quantum computing? Well, the reason is very simple. If you look at what is known as Moore's law that was uh, invented in 1965 with Gordon Moore, the transition count in standard silicon hardware has roughly been doubling every year since. And this has been a phenomenal growth that has allowed us to solve a lot of very complicated problems across industries. Now, of course, this cannot go on forever simply because you can only pack so many transistors on a chip and at some point, you cannot go below, say, the thickness of one atomic line to make an actual wire. And so you have four options to keep extending this law. One of them is building larger chips. That's gonna be a tough sale. Building faster chips, well, that's not really gonna happen. And that is very nice to demonstrate it when you look at the clock speed of current CPUs. The older folks in the audience will remember that back when I was in doing my PhD and now I'm aging myself, um, if you had a computer that had twice the clock speed, it was twice as fast. Well, that changed roughly in the year 2000 where clock speeds have been remained constant. And the main reason is removing heat from these processors has become increasingly difficult. So if you wanna continue extending this exponential growth in compute power, you have to think outside the box. Either you go beyond the standard CMOS technology using silicon or the part that I like, invest brain cycles in algorithms. And the main reason for that is it's easy to create an algorithm that is say quadratically faster. It's very hard to quadratically expand the size of a data center. Good. So let me give you a very high level technology overview, mostly 
just to say a little bit about the different types of quantum hardware and in particular who the main players are. First of all, more importantly, what is a quantum computer? Many people think that a quantum computer is gonna be something that will sit on our desktop, maybe it will, who knows, but it can be used to play Tetris or do a phone call. I don't think I will live that day because as far as I can tell, especially today in the foreseeable future, a quantum computer will basically be a coprocessor. Think like a graphics processing unit that you use, for example, for number crunching and, um, and body stimulations that leverages quantum effects. And the differences to classical CMOS are relatively simple to, to show, but very hard to explain. In a classical computer, you have bits that can be zero or one. I'm showing this on the left panel here. For example, here we have the state zero, and then you use some electronic poles to change it to a state one. Whereas in a quantum bit, you also have a bit known as a qubit that can be in a state zero, but you have an additional effect known as superposition that allows it to be in a state that is say alpha zero plus beta one. Superposition is one of the key ingredients of quantum computing. The other one is entanglement, which means that different quantum bits can share information across a distance. And it's these two effects that allow you to create new algorithms simply because the traditional gates that you get in silicon hardware um, get expanded by a set of gates that allow for more rich operations. And if we leverage these and invent new algorithms that exploit these, we can potentially solve much, much more complicated problems. So let me see a little bit about the different types of hardware backends. Here's a picture from IBM that shows a beautiful cryostat. At the bottom of that chandelier looking thing is where you would mount the actual quantum processor. And right now we are in what John Preston coined as the noisy intermediate scale quantum era, short as NISC. Features are the following. These NISC type machines are digital and programmable. So you can write code. There's different languages. For example, Microsoft created Q Sharp for doing that, that basically allow you to program and write actual algorithms to run on the hardware. At the moment, we're in an era where we have less than 100 physical qubits, and these are relatively noisy. And this is very important, and I'll come back to this later. There's different qubit technologies. You have superconducting qubits, for example, IBM, Google, Rigetti, Amazon is thinking about ideas along those lines. You have trapped ions, for example, IonQ and Honeywell. You have photonic systems on, on chips like Xanadu and Psi Quantum. You have topological qubits, most of them by Microsoft. These are very difficult to build, but have the advantage that they're much more robust to noise. And you have silicon qubits, you have NV diamond centers. There's many, many other types of technologies. But what I want, what I want to emphasize here is that unlike classical compute, where it's very clear which technology we're using, we are at a stage where it's still completely undecided which type of hardware will at the end be the most scalable one. Now, these are digital gate model devices. There's other types of quantum devices. These are the so-called analog devices. And they are very different. While they do leverage quantum effects, they're actually devices built with a very single purpose in mind. So the, the company that has been really the pioneer in this era in this area is D-Wave uh, out of the Vancouver area in Canada that has built machines with approximately up to 5,000 qubits. Now I want to emphasize again, these are analog non-error corrected qubits. So you have low precision, actually typically around five bits, which is not very much. And these machines leverage quantum effects to solve hard combinatorial optimization problems meaning that they are built for one purpose and one purpose only. Now, of course, you can always use this machine, an optimizer, to do other types of operations, the same way that you can take a power drill to hammer a nail into a wall. While you might succeed in doing that, it might not be the optimal tool to do so. Here also, yeah, there are different cubic technologies. The well-established superconducting qubits by D-Wave. And by the way, if you guys can see me, this is what a D-Wave wafer looks like with this quantum processors on it. I uh, got this as a gift. Unfortunately, I don't give them out anymore because it's a nice little keepsake. And there's other companies, for example, QERA and a couple others that are using trapped uh, atoms to actually do similar types of optimization devices. Now, these are the two main computing paradigms. There are, of course, other computing paradigms that I'll get to in, a in the next slide. But the beauty is that 
even though these machines have been built, they are very expensive. You can actually access them on the cloud today. The unfortunate state is that the market is very fragmented with those different technologies that I mentioned. And more importantly, there are no unified standards. This will be problematic at some point down the road, especially if you think about it. Today, you can write Python code and run it on all kinds of hardware. Well, we're not quite there yet when it comes to quantum. There's a couple of main quantum hardware cloud providers. You have Amazon Bracket that offers different quantum backends. If you have used AWS's Compute Cloud, then Amazon Bracket is fully integrated. It's a fully managed service that allows you to leverage all the different tools that you have at AWS and mix and match with quantum backends. I'd like to also point out that the goal of this is to democratize quantum. In other words, give the end user the ability to choose different backends, run their quantum algorithms on different pieces of hardware, and then choose what hardware fits their uh, application best. I also want to point out that AWS gives us credits for researchers. All you have to do is to go to amazon.com slash qcredits, and you can write an application and get virtual money to actually run problems on these quantum backends. There is also Microsoft Azure Quantum. I used to be at Microsoft and actually was part of the team that built uh, Azure Quantum. It's similar to Amazon Bracket. However, they do also offer some what is called nature-inspired algorithm backends. In other words, solutions that run on classical hardware. There's IBM that has its own superconducting quantum hardware and a wonderful ecosystem with many tutorials. And then there's other smaller ones you can access, Regetti or IonQ through other channels, for example, such as Strangeworks. Now, what about other devices? Well, there's also quantum encryption devices. Uh, here, USTC in China is leading the way with quantum encrypted communications, uh, satellite networks. There's quantum key distribution to secure communications. Here, ID Quantique has commercial products on the market. And then, of course, you have also so-called quantum random number generators. I got one right here from ID Quantique. It's a little box that you can plug into your computer and it'll produce truly random numbers based on quantum effects and little light pulses. This can be used for crypto applications when you need unique one-time seeds, for example, to seed VMs in the cloud or to see so-called pseudo-random number generators that you need in classical compute. And then there's, of course, other things like sensors, for example, detect pollutants or anthrax in the air that also leverage quantum effects. So let me go now to near-term applications and see a little bit about myth versus reality. If you look at the press, there's a lot of stuff out there, and a lot of it, unfortunately, is misleading, confusing, wrong, sometimes overhyped, and very rarely actually true. What is a killer quantum application? Well, if you look at the problems that humanity is trying to solve, you can very broadly classify them into two big classes, big data problems and then big compute problems. Mind you, these are overlapping sets, by the way. So let's talk about big data problems first. In principle, quantum can handle big data problems. We have Grover's algorithm that gives you a quadratic speed up over classical database search. However, when you look at it a bit more detail, you will see that things are not so easy. This is a figure that I adapt, adapted from a BCG report. On the vertical axis, you have robustness to noise. On the horizontal axis, you have speed up potential. And this axis is by no means some sort of weird uh, linear axis or something like that. It's just a hand wavy type of way of classifying things. On the left, you have no advantage, which are cases where you only have a constant speed up. In the middle, you have polynomial advantage, say x squared, quadratic speed up, or DQE, or Grover. And on the right-hand side, you have exponential speed up, such as HHL for linear equations, Shor's algorithms, or semi-definite programming. And very broadly speaking, you can classify this into two zones. You have the workhorses that are robust to noise, like DQE and QAOA. QAOA is an optimization algorithm for digital hardware. Quantum annealers, as I said before, are special purpose optimizers. And then you have the poor breads on the right-hand side that promise an exponential advantage, which is great because that's where we'll have a lot of impact. But unfortunately, they tend to be very qubit heavy and very, very finicky when it comes to noise. So we really need to build machines that are protected against noise to really exploit these wonderful properties. And then right in the middle somewhere there, we have Grover, not very robust to noise and only quadratic speed up. 
Why is rubber going up in flames? Very simple, because a quadratic speed up is very problematic when you actually have QPU clock speeds that are in the kilohertz. A standard CPU runs at gigahertz. And so the point where these two lines will cross is way out in the future. Not to mention that we still don't have quantum RAM, which of course makes things even harder. So I would say, let's gray out the big data problems. Let's move on to big compute problems. And the first one, most natural one, is chemistry materials research. Why, as Richard Feynman said, a quantum computer is a machine designed to simulate physical and chemical processes. So it might be natural that we start there. Well, let's assume you have an error-corrected quantum computer with 100 logical qubits. This is a figure that I adapted from Yamazaki et al where you see the FDA approved molecules and their appearance frequency as a function of molecular weight. And you can see very nicely, there's a peak roughly around 300 Daltons. But if you now say that roughly speaking, you need one qubit per um, molecular weight to simulate a chemical reaction, then 100 logical qubits gives you this tiny little pink sliver that you see here at the bottom left of the screen. That's a mere, I think, 6% of the FDA approved molecules. And more importantly, you're missing out on this big chunk between three and 600 Daltons, where it's pretty clear that most important drugs live. So if you wanna capture most of the drugs out there and invent new stuff, you'll need about a thousand logical qubits. And this is far, far away. Why is this the case? I use the word logical and physical without much explanation. So let me give you a very high level hand waving explanation. Suppose you have a qubit. You see this qubit has a little orange uh, rim around it. It's because it's a protected qubit and it's a logical qubit. But to do this, you need to do quantum error correction. And for that, typically you need a lot of physical qubits. To give you an idea, if you use the current noisy hardware, the overhead is at least once in, one in a thousand. So if you wanted to have 100 error corrected qubits, to do chemistry, you'll need about 100,000 at least to be able to do any meaningful chemistry. And given that right now we are at the order of about 100 physical qubits, this is far, far in the future, as far as I'm concerned. So chemistry is gonna be probably the most impactful part of quantum computing, in my opinion, but we're gonna have to wait until we have error corrected hardware. What about breaking crypto? Now, the first reaction might be, who cares about breaking crypto? Isn't this something that only agencies like the NSA are interested in? Well, just yesterday I came across a use case that I thought was quite interesting. Some of you might remember that some pipelines in the US were shut down a few weeks back because of a ransomware attack. If we would have the ability to decrypt that cryptocurrency wallet, we would have been able to very quickly repossess the money that was taken from that company. And so there are some good applications of breaking crypto. But what is the reality? One current crypto standard is RSA 2048. And when you're trying to code this up on quantum hardware, yes, you can write down a high level type program, but in reality, you have to go in and really tweak the qubits and try to figure out what is the best way to implement it in a specific type of hardware. This is known as resource estimation. In 2012, the first paper was published using NIST type hardware. And it was estimated that we would need about a billion qubits to factor RSA 2048. I want to emphasize today we factored 35 equals three times, sorry, five times seven. So we're still ways to go. <coughs> Excuse me. This improved to about a bit under 250 million qubits in 2017. And the current state of the art that was published recently is an algorithm that requires 20 million physical qubits and an eight hour runtime. While this might seem very close, keep in mind an eight hour runtime is very long. That means the system has to be remain coherent for eight hours and current coherence times are of the order of microseconds. So again, a very hard problem. If you had error corrected hardware that works peachy well, then you would need only quote unquote 4,100 logical qubits to actually break RSA. And again, I think it's fair to say we're relatively safe for the time being especially because in the meantime, we have so-called post-quantum crypto schemes that are immune to these attacks. And NIST here is leading a competition to define the next level of standards. So again, I think we're very safe with our crypto wallets. What I'd like to do now is 
focus on optimization. And here is the part where quantum can ha have an impact today in the near term, medium term, and hopefully in the long term. And the nice thing about optimization is that is one of those things that once you start thinking about it, you will see it appear everywhere from organizing a dinner party to shipping containers, to load balancing data centers, you have optimization in every single industry around the globe. So if you can build a machine that can solve optimization problems exponentially faster, for example, that is, can, done, can be done today, just imagine how much faster you would get your packages from Amazon in the mail. So let's talk about optimization. Now, what is a typical workflow when you're trying to solve an optimization problem? And I want to emphasize this because people that have an operations research background have to do this every time that they're trying to solve an optimization problem. Let's take, for example, portfolio optimization and finance. The idea is that basically you have a set of assets and you want to find a mix of assets that, for example, reduces your risk. So that at the end of the day, you make a good profit, but at the same time, you know, you are mostly sure you, know, you will not lose all your money. The way you do this is in the following two steps. The first step is putting down a mathematical representation of the problem. And the physicists here will know this. You know, when you take an apple and you let it drop, we know exactly which equations to use. Well, it's the same thing here. We have a process that is happening. We need to find a mathematical representation. And the keen people in the audience will have noticed that this is the Hamiltonian of an Ising model that I put down Basically, portfolio optimization is a cousin of the Ising model plus some additional constraints that have to be baked in. Now that you have this mathematical representation, you can use whatever backend you have to solve the problem. This can be the D-Wave Compton Annealer. It can be Alpha Cubo, a state-of-the-art software solver for meta-analytics for these types of equations. Gurobi, for example, that is one of the workhorses in, in optimization. Ion Q's hardware, whichever. And then from that, you get your result. But the key ingredient here that I wanna emphasize is this modeling part, this first step. And the reason is that when you sit down and write down a mathematical rep representation for an actual real world problem, it is very important that you think about how you're gonna do this. You can do a representation that will work on current solutions today, or you can do a representation that you might be able to solve today, but might also be suitable for quantum hardware tomorrow. And so investing into how you're going to put the problem in mathematical form can make your results or your solutions future-proof. And that's what I want to emphasize in this presentation. So what about optimization today and tomorrow using quantum-related technologies? Digital quantum hardware, well, it's going to be very hard with NIST hardware. The reason is that the optimization algorithms are variational, meaning that you have to repeat them over and over and over again. And since you have noise, you also accumulate errors and then makes these methods relatively imprecise. What about analog quantum hardware like D-Wave? Well, first of all, as the name clearly suggests, it's analog, meaning that you have errors there too. And more importantly, chips like the one that I have right here from D-Wave have the problem that the actual qubits are hardwired together. So for example, this is a figure I adapted from a paper by Vicky Choi. Uh, so suppose your qubits, these circles here, are hardwired in a square lattice. And suppose the mathematical problem you're trying to solve lives on a graph that you see here on the left-hand side, uh, right here in this figure. Now, to be able to embed this problem into the hardware, you see that variable one needs to be replicated four times and connected with very strong bonds that are put in here in yellow, such that you can accommodate all the other interactions that you have given the constraint that you're in a square lattice. And as you can see already, there is an incredible overhead when doing this. The same thing happens, for example, with variable tree that you need to duplicate just so that you can accommodate interactions with four and two. Now, what's the alternative? Well, let's go back to the previous slide. How about we try to map real world problems to Hamiltonians? And we solve this today by mimicking quantum processes or physical processes on classical hardware. And tomorrow, if the, the hardware is at the level that we need, we run them on quantum backends. Now, what do I mean by nature-inspired optimization? Probably the simplest example is quantum annealing of an Ising Hamiltonian. The Ising model that is basically the fruit fly of statistical physics 
turns out to be a mathematical representation that works for several hard combinatorial optimization problems in industry. And so typically, when you want to solve this with quantum annealing, it's best to take a step back and think about simulated annealing, which is the statistical physics counterpart. What you do in simulated annealing is you have a problem, you attach a temperature to it, you heat it up, think about metallurgy, you heat up a piece of metal and you work it, you cool it down slowly in the hope of removing imperfections. In simulated annealing, you do exactly that. You heat up the system, you cool it down slowly, and then basically, if you do this slow enough, you might be able to overcome some barriers in the energy landscape and then find the optimum. In quantum annealing, you do basically the same, except that instead of thermal fluctuations, you use quantum fluctuations. And if the barrier is thin enough and you reduce the, these fluctuations slow enough, in other words, adiabatically, then the system might be able to tunnel through the barrier and potentially find the solution faster than say with thermal algorithms. But now we know that building digital quantum annealing machines is very hard. So what if we just say, how about we just simulate the quantum process on classical hardware? We just say, we don't care about the physics. We just treat it as an optimization algorithm. Then basically we have simulated quantum annealing, in this case in the non-physical limit. It might give you a boost over simulated annealing. It might not be as good as an error corrected piece of hardware but it's another tool that allows you to solve the problem faster. So the idea is very simple, overcome the hardware limitations of quantum backends by treating physics algorithms as optimizers. The advantage is not only can you solve today often better than what is currently done, but you have future ready formulations for very hard optimization problems across domains. Let me show you how well this works. And before that, I wanna show you a little bit all the types of different algorithms that I would call nature inspired that we have at our disposal. In the big blue box, you have nature inspired methods. You can roughly speaking separate them out into physics inspired methods. I'll get back to this in a second. Neural networks, reinforcement, supervised, unsupervised learning. These are all also nature inspired in some sense. You have other nature based methods such as genetic algorithms, bat, bat search methods, swarm methods, bees and ants algorithms. And as the names very well suggest, these are very much nature inspired. And then you have the physics inspired ones. You have the quantum and quantum inspired ones. Here we have methods like uh, quantum annealing or, sim uh, or the D-wave machine. Then you have the stochastic nonlinear systems. They are governed by stochastic differential equations. There you have the Toshiba simulated bifurcation machine, which is a software implementation. You have the coherent Ising machine, which is an optical implementation by NTT. And then you have a lot of statistical physics algorithms, which by the way is my expertise, such as simulated annealing, parallel tempering, Monte Carlo, population annealing. And Fujitsu actually made a product called the digital annealer unit that leverages parallel tempering Monte Carlo. Now all these can be paired with other kinds of algorithms. In particular, the physics inspired algorithms work for what is known as a cubo, which is fancy word for Ising Hamiltonian. And you can pair these with all kinds of traditional mathematical tools from operations research, such as taboo search, linear programming, semi-definite programming, et cetera. And of course, the biggest value comes in when you treat them all as hybrid methods and can mix and match them across different areas. So, let me just say a very, very few words about benchmarking. So when is an algorithm better? So if you wanna determine if an algorithm A is better than B, then typically we look at how it scales. You change the number of variables in the input and you see how the time to solve the problem changes. And so there's two options. You can have a better scaling slope, meaning that algorithm B scales better than A, and you can have a large constant offset. This might not be very good, but if the offset is say 10 to the 10, then it's definitely working. Uh, worth looking into the method. Ideally, you have both. This is not just the whole picture because you can also have better performance. And this is a very subjective metric. You could think of fair sampling. Can your algorithm find all solutions? Is the algorithm exact? Will it give you a proof that it found the correct solution? Is it scalable? In other words, easily parallelizable? Can it leverage accelerators like specialized hardware such as GPUs, FPGAs, or quantum processors? And more importantly, can you think outside the box and build an algorithm that 
doesn't really depend on a particular Hamiltonian or variables, even worse, can you build an algorithm that doesn't require a cost function at all? I know this sounds crazy, but you can use reinforcement learning to optimize problems where there is no well-defined cost function. And these are methods that we use to solve hard problems in industry. So if you wanna compare now algorithms, you have to compare apples to apples. And while in industry, you have multiple standards in industrial benchmarks that you can download online, in physics, especially in the quantum community, there is no standard for binary optimization. And so one thing that I did before I left academia with my team at the university was cre create a tool we call CHUK, which is Australian for chicken, which is a benchmarking suite for binary optimization problems. It includes planted solutions with tunable hardness, and it's as easy as doing pip install CHUK, and you can run this tool. Now, what is it made out of? It uses different types of planted solutions. What does it mean? These are problems where by design, you know the, the, the solution ahead of time, but they have tunable hardness, so they're not trivial problems. And this is mostly work done by my colleague, Firas Hamze, who is an absolute genius when it comes to these things. He developed ways of planting solutions in two and three dimensional graphs with edge sharing plaquettes. The wishard planting problems that are in complete graphs. And to give an idea how well this works, if you just focus briefly on the 2D tile planted problems, on the bottom right hand side, you have this little graph that shows the time to solution as a function of a tuning parameter for different system size problems in a square lattice. And you see nicely that it has an easy hard, easy transition where the peak is roughly four orders of magnitude higher than at the other extremes. So you can really tune and make very hard and very easy problems. You can also create higher order problems simply by mix and matching different lower dimensional problems, either linear or quadratic in the number of variables. And so with this, you have a nice standardized benchmark set that is tunable and that you can use to study algorithms. And with this, I'd like to show you now how these quantum inspired methods stack up against a quantum annealer. This is a little bit of older data that mostly Salvatore Mandra did. Um, it's based on data by Google, by Denchev et al. They looked at the D-Wave machine and compared to classical algorithms. On the vertical axis, you have the time to solution. On the horizontal axis, you have the problem size for some planted, pro sorry, for some problems that were designed to tickle out any quantumness from D-Wave. The three thick drawn lines are the ones from the Google paper. You can see very nicely D-Wave is dark blue at the bottom. It scales extremely well and has a large constant offset compared to simulator annealing, the red line, and simulating the D-Wave using quantum Monte Carlo and classical hardware. Now the picture changes when you start adding more algorithms. And you can see there's many more lines here on this plot, some of which scale very, very favorable compared to D-Wave. And what you can do now is you can fit to the largest system sizes, extract this, the, the leading slope, and then plot that. And this is what you see right here. A smaller slope means better scaling. So the vertical axis is the main scaling exponent. On the horizontal, you have a whole zoo of algorithms. Don't bother really understanding which one's which. The important thing to remember is that if I start classifying them in types of algorithms on the left sequential, then you have this blue band with tempering, and then you have the green band with tailored, you can see that a pattern emerges. In sequential methods, these are methods where you start with a control parameter that has a large value and you tune it down, like in quantum annealing or in simulated annealing or population annealing. Clearly quantum Monte Carlo or simulated quantum annealing is the best scaling algorithm. Then you have these tailored algorithms. That's a bit of cheating because we knew what the problem looks like and then you build an algorithm specifically to solve it. That's a problem because it only works for that one problem. And then you have these tempering methods, replica Monte Carlo and parallel tempering with cluster moves, as you can see, scale extremely well, but are also generic tools. And to give you an idea how well they scale, back in 2016, my team submitted this parallel tempering algorithm to the so-called SAT competition. This is a competition that happens every year where different researchers around the globe submit optimization algorithms to solve these constraint satisfaction problems. These are Boolean problems like the one that I drew here as an example, where you have variables x1, x2, x3, and so on that are concatenated with logical ors. They also can be negated. You also have logical ands. And the goal is to find a valid assignment. Well, we submitted this parallel tempering algorithm and it ended up winning the competition in this very first submission. 
Mind you, the method works so well that in the meantime, it's commercially available. One qubit has it part of one cloud. Fujitsu has built an ASIC around parallel tempering. And Microsoft Azure Quantum has both CPU and FPGAs implementations. So this is really a powerful algorithm that we can leverage for industrial applications. Now, can we do better than that? And now I'd like to tell you about some new results that we have submitted, and you're probably gonna be the first one seeing them publicly. And this is thinking outside the box and doing hybrid solvers. And this is beautiful work that was done by Martin Schutz, Karl Grubaker, with a tiny bit of Helmut Sprinkle on top, but the main glory goes to those two, in really building a hybrid algorithm. And the idea is very elegant. Represent the optimization problem as an Ising Hamiltonian, and then leverage graph neural networks and their scalable implementations in the cloud with machine learning to actually solve these problems at scale. And I'm gonna show you two examples. These are traditional combinatorial problems that have different applications in the industry. One is max cut and the other one is the maximum independent set. So what are these things? Let's look at the graph that you see here on the right-hand side. You see you have five variables they are connected with some edges and max cut is basically a partition of these vertices in two sets, such that the number of edges between the sets is as large as possible. So for example, in this case, if I draw a cut through these edges here, I find my maximum cut to the graph. What is maximum independent set? It's a set of vertices, not two of which are adjacent. In other words, I have to find vertices on this graph. In this case, for example, these two purple ones, that don't touch any other purples and the reds as well. So what we now did is we looked at this on three and five regular random graphs. There's good reasons for that that I'll get to in a minute. We looked at unweighted graphs without dilution and we compared to two of the standard algorithms, German Williamson for max cut and Bopana Hal Dorsen for maximum independent set. Well, how do we do this? Here comes first the physics inspired part. You can write down max cut and the maximum independent set as traditional Hamiltonians. Notice here the variables are zero one, but you can easily convert them into Ising variables. With a little bit of um, back of the envelope thinking, you can see that the maximum cut can be represented in this form, which is again, very similar to some sort of Ising model. The maximum independent set is also similar. Here, this variable P is a penalty coefficient that you have to put in to enforce the constraint. Now I wanna emphasize that this is not just for max cut and maximum independent set. You can generalize this to other problems such as the quadratic assignment problem. You can generalize to higher order polynomials, something that appears a lot in industry, to K-coloring problems, et cetera, et cetera. Now, what about the graph neural network part? Well, you have a graph here on the left-hand side. It has, again, um, five vertices, and you can encode this graph in this matrix A in the following way. Now you can feed this matrix A to the Hamiltonians. In other words, you encode this into this cubo format and the matrix A gets converted to a, to a upper, tri uh, upper triangular matrix Q where the um, line, uh, sorry, where the entries on the diagonal are non-zero. Physicists might notice that that would not be good news, but since the variables are zero and one, x squared equals x. And so the linear terms of the cost function can be pushed into the main matrix because of that. Maximum independent set would look like this. Then you can define a loss function. In other words, you soften the variables x, i, x, j. Then you have to think about training approaches. But then comes the basically the, ma the magic happens in the background where the graph neural network framework where we leverage SageMaker and AWS does the training. This produces then a possible solution. And then all you have to do is project it. And then you find a solution to your combinatorial problem. So how well does this work? On the vertical axis here, you have the cut size versus the number of nodes for a random uh, five regular random max cut problem. The orange dot are German Williamson, the blue dots are this new algorithm. And you can see that we easily are tackling about a million variables in the order of about 15 minutes. But you might say, well, how good is this solution? The reason we use five regular graphs is because Dembo Montanari et al actually can compute analytical bounds. And you can very nicely see that both algorithms perform equally well and very nicely, try, uh, very nicely follow the upper bound, which is very close to optimality. 
Now comes the interesting bit. What about runtimes and scaling? Well, the implementation we used of German Williamson scaled roughly n to the five. The best theoretical scaling is n to the three halves. But you can see that the hybrid algorithm basically scales linearly in the number of variables. And I don't think I need to convince you that linearly is way better than n to the five. We did the same thing with maximum independent set. And again, you see that Bopana Halderson scales roughly as n cubed, whereas asymptotically, again, this physics inspired method scales more or less linearly with the number of nodes. And so you see now by combining completely different fields, machine learning and physics, we're able to create an algorithm that can solve problems that people previously thought, okay, there's no way you can solve one of those with a million variables. And guess what? You can. Now, let me say a few very brief words about industry applications. We come across a lot of people in industry and I tried at a very high level to more or less classify this into different areas. You see now these little colorful squares. Red is either HPC or these nature-inspired methods. Blue is quantum native solutions and orange is machine learning. And these are typical problems that you find all across the industry. But what you can very nicely see is that there's a lot of red squares. There's quite a few blue squares. And of course, there's some orange squares as well. Mind you, I'm sure you can do way more with machine learning, but I have to admit I'm not an expert. But you can see very nicely that you have use cases like protein design, molecular similarity, quantum simulation for chemistry, optimization of clinical trials, logistics, scheduling. You know, you have portfolio optimization in finance, risk analysis, derivatives, fraud, even fraud detection. Now, there's all these things you can do. Automotive, validation, product configurations. You know, if, if you want to buy a fancy German car, you, you face a ton of different options, a lot of which are mutually exclusive. That is a very hard combinatorial problem car sharing, chemistry, these are things that you see all over the place. And then of course you have energy, unit commitment, in other words, how to load balance networks, power arbitrage, risk modeling, et cetera, et cetera. So it's basically for anybody that likes to solve problems, the world is a giant sand, sandbox to play with. Now at the very last few minutes, I wanna say a few words about quantum at AWS. Um, our quantum team is built up on three pillars. We have the AWS bracket service, which is gives you access to quantum hardware. This is mainly intended for exploration, where you can develop your quantum algorithms. It includes backends by IonQ, Rigetti, and D-Wave that you can access and use. It also has simulators. We have a standard simulator. We have a tensor network simulator, and more recently, a uh, simulator that includes noise. Then on the right-hand side of this slide, you have our technology team, which is the Center for Quantum Computing House at Caltech, where we are thinking about how to build our own hardware and software for these quantum devices. Uh, this is mostly work led by Fernando Brandao and Oscar Painter. And right in the middle he sits the quantum solutions lab that I lead, which is basically the glue that brings all this together. We are the ones that talk to customers and try to solve quant hard quantum problems in industry using the different quantum backends and related technologies. And yes, we do take interns. So if you're interested, look out at amazon.jobs. Every year we have a new cohort. And trust me, it's a lot of fun working in a very dynamic company. What about the Quantum Solutions Lab? It's relatively small. As you can see, there's Michael Castoriano, Henry Montague, Grant Salton, Martin Schutz, myself. We also have a bunch of quantum curious people from adjacent teams like Kyle Brubaker, Jason Zhu, Shrikan Chirsagar, who help us out. The team is, of course, growing. And the goal for our team is you know, to collaborate with partners, to educate them on quantum, and to basically build quantum proof of concepts with the hope that one day there will be scalable solutions. And yes, we're hiring. So always look out again, Amazon.jobs. Hopefully, the team will grow soon. So with this, I'd like to come to an end. What's next? I think the main message that I want you to remember is that when you start about thinking modeling real world problems, you should think in a future ready fashion. Think outside the box, focus on hybrid solutions, look at other fields of research because innovation always happens at the intersection of different fields. Ideally leverage accelerators for core tasks. This is a fancy word for if you have a computation that needs to be re repeated over and over again, Use something like an FPGA, an ASIC, or a GPU at the core. Build solutions tuned to specific applications. The one should fit all algorithm is never really the best one. 
you have to think about a specific application whenever you do this. And then finally, whatever you do, think about the fact that there's a cloud. It has millions of cores. You should build in, with in mind to exploit that. And of course, that there will be one day quantum backends that will be scalable and error corrected. And so tomorrow, it's very simple. Once you've done this, all you have to do is swap out your classical optimization backends, for example, when scalable quantum hardware is available. And with this, I'd like to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Helmut, for the really interesting uh, talk. Um, so we had a number of, uh, number of questions. Um, so let me start by asking a, a, a general one. Uh, you've had experiences both as a professor at Texas A&M, and sorry again for um, misspeaking in the, the introduction. No um, and now, of course, in industry, first with Microsoft, and now with Amazon Web Services. Um, what similarities and differences do you find between working in academia in this field and, and working in industry? So I'm going to pretend I'm in court and I'm going to speak candidly. Um, there is a few clear differences. So let me start by the negatives of industry. The negatives is that whatever you do, you're usually keeping in mind that you're working for a company and then there's goals and that whatever applications you build are built to a means. So this, you know, exploration of today, I want to figure out why, uh, I don't know, beer coasters don't fly straight is likely not gonna fly. Um, but there's numerous advantages of being in industry. Uh, number one, you have unlimited funding. You don't have to write grants. Number two, you don't have to teach. Number three, if you join the right team, you'll do a lot of science, even though if it's technically applied science. I mean, I cannot tell you about the things that we're doing today, but I can tell you that we use all these physics tools to solve super interesting problems across industry. And if you want to look at more, just Google any of my old talks where I was at Microsoft and you'll see the things you can do. You see, there's a lot of cool advantages. You work probably with the best people in the field. It's no mystery. Industry pays really well, so it also attracts really good people. Um, and at the end of the day, there's strong ties also still to academia. Every large company has some sort of scholar program that allows faculty to be part-time of the teams. And so you really come in touch with some of the best people on the planet. So, you know, there's pros and cons. Um, you might not get as much freedom as you have in industry where, you know, if you don't want to work today, you don't work today. But on the other side, if you're somebody who likes to get stuff done in a fast paced environment, companies like Amazon are just a dream come true. A very interesting set of comparisons. Thank you. Um, so next, also relatively general question. Um, we've had a few different uh, questions and comments in the chat and by email, asking a little bit about the, the hype, if you like, um, that might be seen to be surrounding quantum computing. Um, so you sort of spoke about, sort of in the last slide, um, swapping out the classical optimization backend for scalable quantum hardware. Um, uh, and you sort of uh, said this was tomorrow in some sense. So if I can sort of pin you down a little bit more on that, what do you see as the most likely near-term application or applications of, of quantum hardware? And when is tomorrow going to arrive? So uh, I'm going to pull up and put on my South American hat. For us, tomorrow means mañana. And mañana means any possible day after today. Okay. As simple as that. Uh, joking aside, it, it really depends, you know, what you define as the very first solid quantum application, because opinions differ. You see, uh, if you're talking to D-Wave, for example, then yes, they're already using the D-Wave for industrial applications. But truth be told, you can still do a lot with classical CPU. For me, the real first quantum application will be the one where we know there's no way we can do this with classical hardware today. And Mind you, it has to be of practical use. So not some you know, manufactured benchmark. And if I look now at the different things that I said before, I'm gonna leave analog devices aside and just talk about uh, the digital devices. In my opinion, the first really impactful applications are gonna be in chemistry, especially in the simulation of systems with strongly correlated electrons. And these are things ca like catalytics. So if you think about things like carbon capture or nitrogen fixation, 
or any other kind of process that requires a catalytic or a metal organic complex, like say organic LEDs and things like that. This is where quantum hardware, once it's available, error corrected and scalable will be useful. And I think the day that we have of the order of 100 error corrected qubits, we're already gonna start seeing the fruits of the hard work that everybody's putting in. The, the, the other thing I want to emphasize is yes, there's all these big companies, uh, you know, IBM, Google, Microsoft, Amazon, that are doing this. And of course it's a race. And of course it's, everybody's competing, but at the end of the day, we're all working towards the same common goal. And that is trying to solve the world's most challenging problems. And this is best mirrored by the fact that we have a quantum beer night in the Seattle area where people from all these companies get together and have beers together. So, you know, at the end of the day, we're all scientists. That's what matters to me. And beyond saying in a very high level terms, chemistry is probably going to be the first high value application. I'm not willing to put my money on any time scales. Uh, I hope I'll be retired by then. Very good. Um, so you mentioned, of course, there uh, that you were uh, talking specifically about about scalable error corrected qubits. Um, various points during your talk, you mentioned um, NISC digital machines um, and uh, sort of separately to, to analog systems. So can you clarify for you what the, the distinction is between sort of a NISC digital machine and an analog machine? Uh, to some extent, aren't all sort of non-error corrected NISC machines actually analog or, or how do you see that? Um, well, I wouldn't put it that way. I think the distinction is somewhat different. Um, for me, a digital machine, at least in, in the, the wording that I chose is a machine that you can program with code. It's an universal device. You see, it's like this laptop right here where you can write echo hello world and it says hello world. A analog quantum device was built with a very specific purpose and that is to solve an optimization problem. You could potentially, you see, this is a quantum random number generator right here. It's built for one task only to spit out random numbers. Yes, it computes something, but it's not a computer. And that's the main distinction that I want to make. An analog device, usually an analog optimization device is designed to solve optimization problems. It is not designed to do complicated math, write programs, do for loops, while loops, et cetera, et cetera, which is the case of the other type of hardware. Okay, thank you. Um, the other thing you mentioned at one point was, was quantum RAM. Um, and the, the question is sort of is, uh, how do you sort of see the role of quantum RAM and to what extent is there a distinction between having genuine quantum RAM and just having a set of qubits with, with very good lifetimes? Um, so for example, also atoms and ions have um, lifetimes of many seconds or there have been ion demonstrations of, of an hour of coherence time. Are these useful for quantum RAM and how would you see that fitting into the, the bigger system? So, so that, that's far above my expertise. I'm going to say it flat out and openly. Um, I'm not a hardware guy. I'm an algorithms guy. Just be very honest with you. And I'd rather not put my finger on something where I'm not a deep expert. Having said that, you see, I personally think that in the more near term, quantum devices are going to be some sort of type of, for lack of a better word, streaming processor meaning that you know, input goes in, output comes out after some operations. The same way that say a tensor processing unit is used for machine learning applications. All it does is streams data and does you know, vector matrix multiplications. And I think that those types of applications are likely gonna be the best ones for quantum. How quantum RAM will be built, when it will come out, I don't know. So for example, when, when factoring RSA 2048, I quote these results that require 20 million qubits. There is an alternative that requires far less qubits, but then it requires QRAM. And I didn't mention it simply because QRAM, we don't know when it's gonna happen. Okay. Um, can you maybe say a few more words um, also in that sense about the, the requirements of the algorithms you've been talking about in terms of, in terms of qubit quality, um, whether that's sort of fidelities or uh, I guess connectivity as well. You mentioned sort of to avoid maybe that the, the embedding problems. Um, so can you say something maybe uh, about you know, what, what the requirements are and what the comparative qualities are, if you like, of the qubits you're mentioning at the beginning of your talk? So it's very hard for me to compare different providers uh, simply because, you know, it's, it's just not easy. Not all the data are published. 
Uh, there is a great website called Quantum, Re Quantum Computing Reports that collects all the specs that appear here and there in the media and where you can really have nice tables and compare apples to apples as much as you can. And, and so what is important to say, though, is that I think, unfortunately, and, you know, there's never a free lunch, uh, the algorithms that will scale exponentially have very high fidelity requirements. And so building these types of algorithms, think of Shor's algorithm or HHL for solving linear equations, those will really require us to have good error corrected solid hardware. There's the other ones that are more like the quick and dirty type of algorithms that are much more robust to noise like QAOA, for example, for optimization. And so, so it really strongly depends on the algorithm as to which hardware you will use. And, and this is where I think having all these hardware backends in the cloud is so important because when you look at the implementations that are done by different companies, you can write some code to solve a problem. And typically you change maybe about one line of code where you just target a different hardware backend. And then you can run that algorithm you developed on different backends and compare. And you will very soon see that on one backend, you get, like, for example, you write code for something where you know the answer, okay, a simple problem. You will very quickly see how does each method compare with each particular uh, um, hardware backend. Now, to make matters even worse, um, there is no clear set of really industrial relevant benchmarks that has been developed yet for digital quantum backends. And there's right now a program being launched by DARPA that focuses exactly on that. You know, what are good benchmark problems for these digital devices so that we don't just compare with toy problems, but we compare with relevant things. And I think that those, that step has to be developed first, the same way that, for example, my team developed these benchmark suites for combinatorial problems. And then once that is there and we start to see coming in the data, then we can probably make much more educated comparisons and also statements about what are the real requirements and not just the fictitious requirements? Because everything on paper looks very different than once you run it on a quantum backend. Mm -hmm. So if I ask you a similar sort of question about the, about the analog um, machines, um, you've shown that there's a lot you can do with physics inspired and nature inspired classical algorithms um, that compete or do better in many cases than, than quantum annealing. Does that change if we start to go towards coherent quantum annealing rather than thermal quantum annealing? And what opportunities do you see maybe for the um, uh, for analog devices to do something useful beyond what's possible on a on a classical computer? So it, it's it's a very clear case of you know remove everything that we know and look at the things we don't know. And so if I, for example, take D-Wave as an example, we're using a transverse field quantum annealer. In other words, you induce the quantum fluctuations by a transverse field. This can be simulated relatively straightforwardly on classical hardware. It's a bit expensive CPU-wise if you want to do the physical limit, but it's doable. I think that there's still a lot of untapped answers. So think about, for example, using non-stochastic drivers. These are very hard to simulate, if not impossible, on classical computers. And they may, un may unlock things that we might not be able to solve on classical hardware. And so I'm still rooting for the day that D-Wave comes out with the non-stochastic driver quantum annealer, even as basic as it is, because that will show us if there is something else to kind of take out of this technology that could be really groundbreaking versus what it can do today. Does it have to be, um, be non-stochastic if it's um, coherent? So in other words, if there's no coupling to the, the environment, if you, have, um, if you have a system that's well isolated? Even if it's well isolated, um, I still think, so, so it's, I, I answered the question without answering the question, to be honest with you. Um, of course, you want to have a system that is, you know, as decoupled as possible from the environment, which is very, very hard. Uh, I have a rough idea of how much work D-Wave puts in, puts in into isolating these qubits and making them as disappearing as possible in some sense from the environment. But I think that's a lesser problem. I don't think that the coherence is going to do much because we can simulate the coherent system and we see what it can and cannot do. I think we need to look beyond that and even say, well, why don't we forget about coherence? Why don't we just look quantum fluctuations? But then at the same time, what we have to do is say, well, maybe we should look at things that classical cannot do at all, like non-stochastic. 
Um, a couple of, um, of other maybe um, slightly more general questions to, to finish with. Um, firstly, uh, one question we got in the chat was, um, how do you see the, the development of, of hybrid compute environments? Um, what are the opportunities for a combination of, of classical computing, uh, high performance computing maybe uh, combined with, with, with quantum hardware? Uh, frankly, I think that's the future. You see, classical computers are really good at some things. Quantum backends are really good at other things. And it's the combination of those two technologies. Uh, I can give you a very simple, very high level example. If you wanna simulate, for example, uh, some sort of you know, protein molecule, then usually that's done with molecular dynamics. It's a very large macromolecule. And that's where classical HPC is gonna excel. But if you wanna have a really good indication of what the force fields are, the realistic force fields, then you could use a quantum device to compute those numbers precisely and then feed them into the classical simulation. And there's many workloads like that where you can combine both technologies, also different quantum technologies. You could run a variational algorithm on a digital backend using then the analog backend to optimize the parameters. So mix and match in all possible directions. And I think honestly, that's the future. And I think that the results that Kyle and Martin produced mixing physics and machine learning just show that, you know, suddenly you can scale to a thousand X of what you did before. And finally, I mean, you've, uh, you have a number of sort of classical algorithms that have been maybe inspired by ways that people have tried to solve problems on, on, quantum, on quantum hardware in particular, you know, taking quantum annealing from D-Wave. When you think about things like the hybrid algorithm that you showed towards the end of your talk, um, these, these nice new ideas, do these give you know, maybe new ways to, um, to develop different types of quantum algorithms in the future? Could you imagine taking something like your combination of machine learning and physics inspired algorithms, putting that back on a quantum computer? And do you see opportunities for that to generate quantum advantage in the future? Uh, well, that's a big open-ended question, but the answer is absolutely. We, we just don't know. You know, the research in algorithms is wide open. Uh, if, you lo if you go to Stephen Jordan's website, the Quantum Algorithm Zoo, you will see that there is a zoo, but it's a very sparsely populated zoo when it comes to really exponentially scaling algorithms. And so taking back what we know in classical and trying to maybe bring it into quantum or vice versa, you know, saying, what if you sprinkle quantum fluctuations on some classical methods? it might lead to new results, new techniques, but that's the fun part. This is why we're not gonna go out of business anytime soon. We still keep doing science. Brilliant. Well, thank you very much again, Helmut, um, both for the really nice talk and for your, your really nice answers to the questions as well. Um, and I'll hand back to Sebastian. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you also from my side, Helmut. Uh, really cool and inspiring talk. I'd like to take this opportunity to remind everybody of our fourth hot topics session on July 15th. So if you've done something as cool as Helmut, please have a look at our website and send us your nominations by July 1st. Um, next week on July 1st, we will have yet another talk by Nicola Poli, who will speak about atom interferometry with alkaline earth metal atoms and precision, precision measurements associated with that. If you want to get notified about what we do, please go to our website, quantumscienceseminar.com. You can subscribe to our email list, our Google Calendar, and you can follow us on Twitter as well. With that, I'd like to thank you for your interest, and we hope to see you again next week, same time, same place. Bye.